significant in my mind that the Lord would go out of his way. One of the reasons I make that statement is Jesus, Jesus said that he was sent to the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. And for him to step outside of the Jews mm -hmm. to minister to a Samaritan woman is quite significant. It was not an accident that Jesus met her at the well. I, I want to encourage you in that the Lord knows where you reside. That's right. He knows what you're facing. He knows everything about what is going on in your whole life. And that should bring uh, calm assurance to every one of us. The Lord sees. He's not turned off That's right. because we're not perfect. He he doesn't turn away from us because we, we don't fit in socially mm -hmm. or culturally or econ economically. But he's, he's willing to go to where people need them or need him. During, during his encounter with them, Jesus ministered to this woman who was in trouble. And the, the ministry that we saw last week when Jesus looked at this woman at the well and perceived that she was thirsty, but not really for the water in the well, but for the water that he had to give. That's right. Uh, I'm glad to tell you, and I've seen this, and I know that many of you have also seen that the Lord knows how to find people who are in trouble. Right. I could ask tonight for personal testimony. Some of you might give them and some probably would not want to give your personal testimony about the sin and sinfulness of your life. Mm -hmm. Most of us really don't want everybody to know all of the sinful thoughts and actions that we have taken. But it's good news to know that the Lord is willing to come to hurting people to minister to them at their points of need and to seek and to save that that is lost. And every one of us should shout for joy that the Lord was willing to do that. Amen. Jesus cannot offer everlasting life to anyone without dealing with the issues that are going on in our life. If we took a survey of people in the world, people that you know, and you asked them, do you want to go to hell? Most of them would say no. I have, over the years, I've run across a few people, and they've been very few, that said, yeah, I want to go to hell, and we're going to have a big party. All of my drinking buddies are going to be there, and we're going to just throw a ride. No, they're not. That's not what hell is all about. Mm -hmm. The good news is that Jesus will offer living water yes. and everlasting life to people who are unworthy and unfit. When Jesus offered, and we looked at this last week, when he offered this living water to this woman, you know the scripture is not real clear there about the salvation of the woman, but it's my opinion from the context that when he offered her this living water, Jesus was saying, I'm giving you salvation. I'm offering you new life. And I believe because of the response 
that this woman willingly accepted the gift that Jesus offered her. But before the transaction could be complete, Jesus has to deal with the sin in her life. You know, it would be a terrible thing, wouldn't it, if we were saved to continue in our sin? It just doesn't work that way. He saves us from our sins, not in our sins. So any time that the Lord offers everlasting life to us, He must also offer a change for our life. I don't want to have eternal living with a heart that is condemned. With an attitude that is wrong and with no access to God. So at, at the well, after Jesus offered the woman living water, he begins probing her secret life. And I, I know, have any of you ever fallen under conviction by the Holy Spirit? Has that ever happened in your life? <laughs> you know that the Lord knows everything about you. There are no secrets with God. He knows our thoughts. He knows the intent of our heart. Before anything ever comes to action, the Lord already knows what our thoughts and our plans are. And so Jesus begins dealing with the secret things that she's really not willing to discuss. And the way that the Lord does it is he really probes with one question. He knows her so well, all he has to do is ask her, let me speak to your husband. And she said, I have no husband. Verse 17, we'll continue in John. You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband, in that you truly spoke. In other words, she was living out of wedlock. Just the implications, especially in that culture. Uh, it, it's a lot different than it is in the culture today. There are so many people that have been divorced and married so many times or had so many lovers and so many friends, sleep-ins, that they can't count them all. And in this case, she was living in a culture that doing what she was doing, she could have easily been taken outside of the city and been stoned. Because that's the way that it is. You go to that part of the world today, they're still following the traditions of that, of that ideal. So this woman uh, realizes within herself immediately that this man that she's been talking to at the well is not just any man. That he's unique. She was... Uh, you know, has anyone ever read your book? Do you know what I mean? They look at you and they say, I know everything that you've been thinking. And it's like, wow. <laughs> she was immediately aware that Jesus knew the intimate and secret details of what was going on inside. And that's a, that is extremely strange for her to meet a stranger and he knows everything about her. Now it might be different if, if Jesus had lived in the community with her and knew all of the men that she had been with, but she is sitting with a Jew, someone she's never met before, and he is, he is reading her book. He's telling her things that she's been doing. And then the woman says, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> In other words, you know something that you shouldn't know. You know, a lot of people try to cover up what they've been doing. But it's just amazing to me what people think they're getting by with, with God. And they think that God somehow just doesn't know until God comes down in their life and he says, I know the secrets of your heart. I know what you've been doing. 
And this man by the well had supernatural knowledge, so she thought he must be a prophet. She, it never entered into her mind that this must be the Son of God. Now, a prophet, obviously, in the Old Testament, knew secrets, and a lot of times they would tell the secrets of people's hearts. But now she is sitting there by the well with the Son of God. Can you imagine what it must be like to be sitting by the well and be impure and be sitting with God? I can't even imagine. Uh, and, and then the, the revelation, the knowledge that comes because it's about to hit her. Jesus is going to tell her, the one that is sitting with you is the Messiah of God. At this point, she's still in that, uh, the veil's being taken off of her eyes a little bit at a time. And she's beginning to perceive that things are not really right in my life. H have you ever been living in a way that you knew, I'm not doing the right thing, but nobody knows. And as long as nobody knows, I'm okay. Well, that seems to be the attitude that's going on in this person's heart, this woman's heart. But I really believe, and it's a personal conviction of mine, that people who are not right with God know they're not right with God. But isn't that the way that so many people are? I can get by with it as long as nobody around me knows. The, the truth is, God has supernatural knowledge of our lives and He knows what's going on. Jesus knew things, this man knew things that he should not have known unless he was a prophet of God. Now, as soon as she realized this, she realized that she was in, in the presence of someone that outclassed her, that knew more than he should know. And she could really not argue her case about being good. I, I, I don't know why we self-justify but so many people do this they they start saying well I'm not so bad the person down the streets a whole lot worse than I am you ought to know my wife <laughs> you, you, know, you know what I'm saying we we begin offering up all, all kinds of arguments about why we're so good and the truth of the matter is, sin is at the door. And we're living with a heart that is condemned. As soon as he began telling her the secrets of her heart, she immediately began to feel the weight of her sin upon her. And, and this is what so many people do when that happens. Instead of confessing sins and repenting, she began chatting or arguing about religion, about worship and theology. And she knew so much about it. After all, her parents had worshipped. I, I, I don't know the numbers of times I, I've run across that same thing. You start visiting with somebody and it gets around to getting right with God and they will say, well, I'm a member of such and such church. And you ask them, well, when was the last time that you were in church? Well, I can't recall. <laughs> the Bible makes it clear that the person who hides their sin is in danger. Yes. You can't really be saved and hide your sin. You're in, you're in danger of hellfire if you think that you can hide sin and get away with it. Instead of me, uh, admitting her need, this woman wanted to appear spiritual before this man who was, in her mind, a prophet. Verse 20. She says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Isn't it interesting that uh, people have so many concepts about what we're supposed to do when we are a Christian or when we're right with God. 
She knew something about the worship of her fathers. She knew how and where her people worshipped and that her people worshipped differently than the Jews did and that they worshipped in different places and they had different ideas and theologies and, and uh, concepts about where God's presence was. Rather than admitting that her life was in trouble and she needed salvation, she would rather talk about ancient issues that had never been resolved. You know, you, you never can win anyone to God talking about ancient religious issues. You can debate all day long about the difference of this church and that church and the other church and which which place you should worship at and which day you should worship on and, and how you should do it and how you should dress and you can go on and on all day long and all night long and never get to the issues that are really happening in our hearts. Amen. You can see this woman, in my opinion, it's very clear. She starts squirming. She's she's inadequate. She's feeling that something is wrong in her. She's in the presence of one who knows what's really going on. So let's talk about religion. Let's talk about the way that my people worship and your people worship. I know we're different. So your people worship over there in Jerusalem and our people worship over here. And, and we, we think that we're right and you think that you're right. So there's a divide between us. Jesus is not going to allow this woman to do this because God has appointed this moment so that she can be saved. Right. You see, there's really more at stake than just this woman in Samaria. Her whole city is at stake. In fact, that whole region is at stake. This is an open door that God has created. You need to know this. In case God should ever set up a divine appointment for you, it's never just for that one moment. God sets up divine appointments that, that are expansive in their realm. You may think that you're just talking with some stranger on the street. And really what God is doing, he's, he's meeting with you and it, it's that person from another country or that person from another region that they're going to be one to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're going to go home and they're going to tell their whole community, their whole family, look what the Lord has done for me. The Samaritan said that God's presence was in Mount Gershom and the Jews said he dwelt in Jerusalem. Traditionally, and, and I've done some research on this, some are not even sure that Mount Gershom was where Abraham offered Isaac on the altar. But it, that's the way that tradition works, don't you know? It really doesn't matter the truth, it's just whatever your tradition says. There, there are people that get so bound with traditions and rituals and observances that those things are more important than what God's Word says. Tradition also says that this is where Abraham met Melchizedek. Uh, it's, it's really interesting to me how people can get so divided and so filled with hatred and prejudice against one another mm -hmm. over things that are not even significant. I better leave that and go on. But I, I see in the world, there are many places that people will go and they think, if I can only get to this city, if I can only get to this person, if I can only get in this environment, all of my answers. I will really be able to worship if I get there. Friends, Jesus is saying there's coming a day when it doesn't matter which city you're in, which mountain you're on. You can worship God anywhere. That's good news. <coughs> John 4 and 21. Jesus said, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain, nor in Jerusalem, worship the Father. 
Jesus is talking to her about true worship, not about following the traditions of men. Now, I've said quite a bit already about tradition and worshiping in Jerusalem. You go back into the law, go back to the tabernacle, and then to Solomon's temple. God ordained that they would worship in that place. Some of you were in the study a few years ago when I showed you the Yahweh symbol on the mount in Jerusalem. It's, it, it's in the mount. God put his name there. He said, this is my city. He claimed it. In the end, there will be a new Jerusalem. So what is Jesus talking about when he says Jerusalem is, is really not the significant thing? I think what has happened and what has happened in so many people, not just then, but also today, so many people have paid so much attention to the building, to the city, to the tradition, that they have left God out of it. And that, I think, is what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about true worship is not the place. True worship is God. He wants you to worship God with your heart and with your mind and with your soul. He wants you to worship God with spirit and with truth. Jesus said, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. And then he says, we, and Jesus is referring to the Jews, we worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Now, it's interesting, uh, and it's probably a longer study than I would want to get into tonight, how God opened up salvation to the world through the Jews, through Abraham and through his descendants. And it comes down through Jesus Christ. God has made it possible for everyone who will believe to be saved. Now, Jesus is talking about True worship to this woman. True worship is more than being on the right, right mountain or in the right place that our forefathers have accepted. Jesus said true worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Verse 22, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. But we worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. She again is perceiving that this prophet standing before her is piercing the, the inner secrets of her life. She has nowhere else to squirm. And this man who is a prophet of God can see directly into the things, the thoughts, and the intents of what's going on. Down deep, she realizes she needs help. You see, that's what the Holy Spirit does. And it is an amazing thing to me how uneasy we will be and we will persist in our uneasiness rather than yielding to God and saying, God, change my heart. I, I choose to do what you want me to do. Mm -hmm. Rebellion from sin draws us away from God. But that conviction, and I thank God for conviction, the conviction of the Holy Spirit that says you need to get it right with God. The Holy Spirit will do this in our life and He will draw us to the place where we come before the Lord and we worship and bow down before Him and we, we realize it. it's not the place, it's not the form, it's the Lord God Almighty. Right. Now, Jesus was showing us something about true worship. He says, yet a time is coming and has now come so Jesus has said, the time for this transition is on us right now. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. The hour is coming that would change the whole nature of worship. In fact, in Jesus Christ, we see a transition from the law and the sacrifices to a different kind of worship that, that is instituted in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, we no longer have to go and sacrifice bulls and, and sheep and 
oxen in order to worship and have an altar that we burn sacrifices on. We can come to God at any time through the blood of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that has already been made. There is no other sacrifice that needs to be made than that one that is made, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension, and His coming, the coming of the Holy Spirit has changed everything. The way that we worship today is completely different because of what God has done. Aren't you glad that you don't have to travel to a certain city and have a high priest who will offer a bullock on an altar for you so that you can be atoned? Right now, in this very meeting, this very instant, any one of us can come before God in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So what is true worship? True worship means that believers enter God's presence by faith and they worship Him. Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit changed everything. He opened up a new and a living way into the presence of God. Let me digress just a minute. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, the scripture tells us the veil of the temple was rent or was torn from top to bottom. From that moment, access to God came in a different way. We no longer have to go to the temple in Jerusalem. Now we can come straight to the throne room of grace and find mercy and help. And this is what the Holy Spirit does in our life. Through Jesus Christ, He draws us to this place where we can come into the holy presence of God through the blood of Christ and have true worship. The blood of Christ and the blood and the cross of Christ have made this access possible for every one of us. I want you to think a minute about the free access that every one of us have. I, I try as pastor to let you know the depth of meaning of this. And I, please don't take me wrong. I don't, I'm one of the very few pastors who has their phone on 24 hours a day. I don't mind you calling. I will pray with you if are you any time. But I want as pastor to instill within you a faith that says, I don't have to call on anyone but Jesus. That's right. Thank you, Lord. I want you to have such a knowledge of your accessibility that you know that I can plead the blood of Christ and I can call on the name of Jesus and He's just as real and just as near as if I call the pastor or call that healing evangelist. You don't have to send hundreds of dollars to a tele-evangelist for him to pray for you, for you to be healed. Jesus is just as real to you right wherever you are. You can have access to God. You can come into His presence yourself through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus was telling this woman about a radical new life of worship and relationship with God the Father. Worship had been known in centuries about a way that they would worship and now Jesus is changing the possibilities so that wherever you are, you can be in a dungeon. The Apostle Paul and Peter proved that. You can be in prison. You can be anywhere at any time and call on the name of the Lord and He is near to you. Hallelujah. And He's able to help you. He's able to come into the room where you are. It's so important for us to realize that worship, whatever worship entails, and I, I, I think when we use the word worship, some people only get the, the mindset of lifting their hands and praising. Worship is more than that. Worship is prayer. Worship is communication. Wor worship is entering into wherever God is. 
coming before him and bowing down and giving homage to him, giving worship and praise to him, for he is worthy. Yes, amen. Once again, Jesus said, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for our salvation is from the Jews. Jesus says, you worship what you do not know. She had enough knowledge to talk about the way that her forefathers had done it, but she really did not have a relationship with God. I don't know the numbers of people over the years that I have pastored who have been able to talk about the way that we do it, but they did not really have a relationship with God. You probably know someone like that yourself. That they can talk about well, I, I believe the Bible. But they don't pray. They don't know Him. Jesus is talking about an encounter with the living God. He's talking about entering into this worship. So Jesus is in introducing this. Let's go back to verse 24. God is a spirit and His worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, the word spirit has many connotations that I need to address. Spirit, if you're in high school, you have a spirit cheer rally where everybody comes in and gets worked up for the big game. It's emotion. It's spirit. It's full of spirit. Spirit is also attitude, character. Spirit is fortitude. Spirit is animation. I, I've seen some people think that all that spirit is is if we're jumping. I, I've been in conferences where they said, oh, the spirit really moved. Everybody was jumping. Well, that is not necessarily in spirit. It was spirit, Joel. But there's a difference. When God created man, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. He, he possessed spirit. It enabled man and God to have communication one with another, fellowship one with another. And in that fellowship, God intended that to be the nature of man's relationship with God. It was a unhindered by sin. It was not warped. It was not wrong. There was no pretense. Everything was open. I think that deals with the word truth. In spirit and in truth. Jesus is talking about an openness that must take place when we are worshiping God. What kind of worship is, is it that is in spirit and truth? First, is spirit-filled worship must be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. I think, really, you'll know the difference when the Holy Spirit starts worshiping through you. It's, it's so obvious when the Holy Spirit is involved. He quickens our worship. Uh, he, he gives us words to speak and songs to sing and a new attitude in our heart. So I, I, I do believe that Jesus is referring to that maybe on the fringe area of this. Second, to worship God in spirit means to worship God with spiritual drive and the ability of our innermost being. So it's, it's putting everything else aside. With all of our mind and with all of our strength and with all of our body, we put it in to worshiping God. And, and that can be in so many different ways. My mother was a very quiet person. She worshiped the Lord with her hands about here. I mean, that's the way that she worshiped God. My grandma was about like this. My other grandma was a shouter. And when the Holy Spirit would come into the service, she would hoop and holler, and people thought she was a, uh, 
on the war path. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit inflamed her soul. I don't think that it really matters whether we have our hands up and we're animated or whether we are quiet in our worship. There is a reality of it that's in here that says this is bona fide. I'm giving myself to God. And you know the difference yourself. You know the difference if you're just pretending to worship God and if you're really worshiping God. You know, sometimes we come to church. Not you, I'll just talk about me. Sometimes I just come to church and I just don't feel it. Not very often. <laughs> But you know the difference in here when you really feel it. And I think that's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about when you worship God, you should put yourself into it. And know, I'm giving everything that I've got toward God. I'm, I'm yielding myself. May I encourage you, regardless of the manner in which you do it, give the very best of your spirit, your body, and your mind when you're worshiping God. Spirit is a result of that inbreathing of God, the Holy Spirit in, into man, and he became a living, animated being. The same thing I think, think happens today when the Holy Spirit comes upon believers and he transforms us and transforms our worship. It's amazing, and it'll happen any at any service when the Holy Spirit starts coming in and He moves upon individuals and we start responding, that animation, that change, that transformation that occurs in us when we really start worshiping. So how can a man truly worship if their spirit is bound by sin? This is where this woman is. She is trying to get past her sinfulness. And Jesus is saying, there's got to be a change in you. You cannot really worship God correctly in spirit and truth unless we deal with the issues that are in your heart. I know there are some tra traditional, some churches that have a particular tradition. And I speak about it with admiration. Their people will come into their services and before they do anything, they find a place of prayer. And they ask God to cleanse them, to make them fit to be in His presence and invite the Holy Spirit to do a work in their life. I think that's admirable. Whether you kneel or not, I think it would be a good practice for every one of us when we walk into church. We just say, Lord, there's some things I've been dealing with and my attitude's not really good right now. Would you just give me an attitude adjustment? Would you change my heart? Make it so that I am fit to come into your holy presence. I, I think that that's something that Jesus is really speaking to this woman about. And I think by extension, he's speaking to every one of us. If you want to be a true worshiper, if you want to be right with God, you've got, you've got to deal with those issues in your heart. God gave Ezekiel a word about this, and I'll close he says in chapter 37, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. I think that's what Jesus is talking about with this woman. Now, I, I need to back up just a little bit and I won't take but just a minute. Jesus had already told her that she could have living water and that it would spring up to everlasting life in her. That tells me that Jesus was speaking to this woman in a way that she would know you can be saved. And then he deals with the sin that's in her life. The residual sin that is in her life. See, I think, I, I don't know how it happens with everybody. Some people have to deal with the sin issue before they're willing to submit themselves to God. 
And I really don't know that it matters if we deal with the sin issue first or if we say, Lord, I'm yours first. Both are necessary. And I think they're both integral part of the salvation experience. We come to him and we say, Lord, I want you. I want this living water. I want everlasting life. And Jesus says, there's only one thing wrong with you. And we've got to deal with that. And when we deal with that, the rest of this is going to fall in line. And when that falls in line, you're going to be in a place where you can really worship God. Where you can really come into the presence of God. Where you can worship in spirit and truth. So Jesus is laying out some, some doctrinal theological principles that are applicable to our life. If we, will, if we will first of all say, yes, Lord, I want what you have. I want life. I don't want death. I'm tired of what I've had. I want what you have to offer. And then come to him and say, Lord, not only do I want that, do I want what you have to offer me. I want to get rid of the things that have been destroying my life. I want to get rid of the sin, the hatefulness, the, the bad attitudes, the the corruption of my past. Present it to him. He said if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And then this dramatic thing happens where the Holy Spirit settles in and transforms our ability. You know, it's a completely different study of how the priest entered in to the Holy of Holies. But now Jesus is making it possible that whoever believes in Him can enter into a holy place in the presence of Almighty God and find exactly what we're needing. And that's tremendous. The thing that He has made possible for every one of us, it's, it's, it's really mind-blowing, isn't it? That he is, he is opened up a way for you for me to come in. I like what Ezekiel prophesied. That God would put His Spirit in us. And you will live. Thank you, Jesus.